Here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Source Material Comics Podcast. Oh, we are returning for a new trilogy of books. What are we going to get into this time? Well, we talked a little bit about that last time we did an episode together. This go-round, we're going to be talking The Mask. And joining me, of course, here this evening, Mark Radlich. Mark Radlich, did you know what you were going to be getting into when you chose The Mask to talk about tonight? Hey, Jesse. I'm happy to be back on the show. Your your only source material person, I think. It's like me and Evan. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) So I saw the movie when it came out, when Jim Carrey was the height of his powers, when he was on that long streak of every movie he made was a hit. Oh, yeah. So I saw it contemporaneously. Did not know it was based on a comic. And two years later, when I found out whether it was through just researching adaptations to talk about on a podcast or just through talking to comic people, I don't remember who hit me to the jive. I found out that it was, in fact, based on a extremely violent comic book and that the <laughs> right. comic book was way different in tone than the movie was. Yeah. So I kind of knew just based on those casual conversations and research what it was about, but not nothing more than that. I didn't know how much the movie had cribbed from the comic and how much it made up out of whole cloth. And certainly when I got the mask omnibus, which has the mask, uh, I think it's the mask returns and the mask strikes back or something like that. Yep, you got it. Okay. And so I've never read, I never read them before. Now I just kind of was looking, I think I was looking for like a, what, if anything was like a direct adaptation. And the best thing I could find was this omnibus. This, this was like the definitive mask books mm-hmm. all combined. These three series all combined into this one volume. So I'm excited to talk about it. First time I've ever read them. And actually just before we started recording tonight, rewatched the movie. Yeah. Yeah. So how'd that go? Reliving that experience. So I was watching it. W- with the comic book in mind so without getting too much into the books because we're going to talk about them individually i mean the obvious thing is the tone the 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 books are pretty it's a it's a revenge violence it's if you took the punisher and combined him with the joker you have the mask yeah Yeah. and it very much centers on not stanley ipkiss who's only in it for a brief period (laughs) Yeah. yeah it focuses on the detective whereas the movie Ipkiss is the star of the thing. Right. Um, the mask versus the mob is what pushes, at least definitely in the first two books, what pushes the entire plot forward to one mm-hmm. degree or another. And that's kind of what happens with the movie is Stanley Ipkiss runs afoul of Dorian, and Dorian is some sort of mobster to one degree or another. But it revolves around, I can't remember the actress's name, Cameron right. Diaz. Thank you. There we go. And she's sort of your femme fatale and the story revolves around her and it's him versus the mob and the police are involved and the one that's trying to figure out instead of it being the, the detective is the mask after Stanley Ipkiss gets killed. Spoilers. The movie revolves just around Stanley Ipkiss and the cops are trying to catch him in the act mm-hmm. all the while he's dealing with the mob and Cameron Diaz. If you were to ask me which one I prefer, <laughs> I don't know. I can see the mask being much more crowd pleasing, but it's also so sanitized, oh. com- especially compared to the comic. Oh yeah. And I and I hate to be the typical comic book dork that's <laughs> I like my violence, but I kind of <laughs> like my violence, but I also think it's a better story. I think the story in the books is much more interesting because you get a little bit of that Lord of the Rings, the ring is driving me mad thing with the mask. Right, right. In the movie mm-hmm. about the time that he's confessing to the girl that turns him in to the mob that I'm really starting to lose control here. I don't don't have a tremendous amount of control over this mask and I don't know what to do. He loses the mask and ends up in jail. And then there's that whole third act where he has to fight the mob without the mask. Mm -hmm. Whereas the comic book, Detective Calloway really struggles mentally with the mask. You get much more of a sense of the mask is its own and like the ring was in Lord of the Rings. That's why I was making that comparison. You get much more of a sense of how malevolent the mask really is right. and what it does to your brain and how it takes over. And it, it kind of takes your wants and needs and amps them up to like a hundred to where by the time Kellaway does away with the mask in the first book, he's pretty, pretty worse for wear. Oh yeah. 
And I kind of prefer that as a story to what we get in the movie. Yeah. And talking about the movie, I read the wiki there earlier Mm -hmm. and they were talking about who they were trying to cast. And obviously we, I think that as far as casting goes, I don't know if there's more perfect a choice than Jim Carrey to represent this mask in 1994. Uh, No, (laughs) no. I mean, this guy, he is a living cartoon. Yeah. And that is what the mask pretty much is when you boil it down to it. It's, it's a representation of a cartoon character in real life. The only other person they mentioned that could possibly pull it off was Robin Williams. And that might, may have been, may have been on the level of Jim Carrey, but my goodness, yeah, 90, 94, this is... It depends on what year. If it's in the 70s, it's Jack Nicholson. If it's in the 80s, it's Robin Williams. If it's in the 90s, it's Jim Carrey. Okay, I'll I'll go with that. If it's in the that. 2000s, who do you think it is? Okay. What? Who was lanky and insane in 2000? Charlie in, Sheen. In, <laughs> <laughs> man, man, manly man. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I I really don't know. One of the things that made Jim Carrey perfect for it was his body shape. He was just so tall and skinny. Yeah, yeah. He's a nerd. He's got this kind of nerdy look to him, and yeah, and he could pull off the nerd look. Just another thing in his acting repertoire. I mean, the guy was just amazing when it come to some of the roles that he did. But yeah, he was he was great for the for the movie. I don't think I went to the theaters and watched it. This mm-hmm. was one of those rentals. My sister is a huge Jim Carrey fan, so I, I imagine she probably went to see it. Ninety four, I'm like sixteen, I think. So I'm not I'm not heading to the movies to watch this, but. My goodness, they were talking about Ace Ventura, Pet Detective had come out a little bit before this. Dumb and Dumber yeah. was around this time. Right. And this, is, and- this was that hot streak of Jim Carrey movies. Yeah. So if you start with Ace Ventura, Pet Detective in 1994, the same year The Mask comes out, the same year Dumb and Dumber comes out. Oh, my 95, gosh. He, yeah, I know. What a, tr- what a triple <laughs> feature that is. Ace Jeez. Ventura, The Mask, and Dumb and Dumber. And I think they were all hits. Yeah. Yeah. Batman Forever is 1995. Ace Ventura 2 is 1995. Yes. The Cable Guy is 96. Liar Liar is 97. And then that's oh, kind goodness. of it for a while. Because then he starts doing dramas. So okay. between 97 and 98 is when he's, well, they love me as a comedian. But let me put on my, my drama shoes and see how they love me. And so he does mm-hmm. The Truman Show, Man on the Moon. Um, Truman Show is a great movie. Man yeah. on the Moon is a great movie. After that, he does Me, Myself, and Irene, which I actually don't know anything about. Sounds like oh, my movie. goodness. Oh, my goodness. It's Fairly yeah. Brothers, right? Yeah, yeah. Now yeah, I, I yeah just he, play, the he plays a split personality, and oh, my gosh. It's yeah, hilarious. so from this point on, he's kind of mixing it up. So he does Me, Myself, and Irene, and then How the Grinch Stole Christmas, which I think he's excellent in. I don't yeah, love the good. movie as such, but I love him in it. He's good. And then he does the majestic, and then he beats back to Bruce Almighty to a comedy again with Bruce Almighty. And I'm going to leave it here in 2004, though. He he stills pretty steadily doing movies for the next year or two and then he starts taking longer breaks he does a three-year break between 05 and 03 that's 05 and 08 but uh, yeah after bruce almighty which was all kinds of silly he does eternal sunshine of the spotless mind i have not seen that heard a lot of stuff about it. it's weird yeah (laughs) it's a weird movie anyway well yeah jim carrey as the mask Pulled it off in 94, definitely, in my opinion. I'm glad you revisited the movie. I wanted to. I just didn't have the time. Uh, yeah, but I watched like an it. Impromptu, we kind of did like an impromptu comic strip. Yeah, that's all right. That's okay. Um, so hopping into the creation of The Mask, just to kind of give you a brief summary. Mike Richardson, a guy by the name of Mike Richardson, created the base concept of The Mask in 1982. The initial sketch was made, for, made in 1985 for APA, which... Uh, APA-5, I don't know what the per- Acolyte Protection Agency has anything to do with this, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> a publication by Mark Verheden, developed by Verheden? Richard Verheden. Verheden. Does he, he like be. meatballs? I like meatballs. <laughs> Ikea? Yes. Ikea. Richardson pitched the concept of Marvel Comics as Mark Badger, leading to the Mask, M-A-S-Q-U-E, strip in Dark Horse Presents. The strip evolved politically, prompting Richardson to return the original concept. And the revamp is what we kind of get here in these books. Artist Chris Warner redesigned the character based on Richardson's original sketch. Warner design, Warner's design debuted in 89 in Dark Horse's Mayhem Anthology. And then John Arcudi and Doug Mankey. Mankey? Mankey. I'll go with Mankey. Created new adventures for the character, and that's what we're going to get into here. This starts in 91. Their work is described as a mix of Tex Avery and the Terminator. 
think. <laughs> yeah. I was definitely getting a lot of Tex Avery vibes. And I think yeah, you could call it the Terminator, Punisher, unrelenting killing machine. I I, I liked my I liked my description of it. If what if you took the Punisher, merged him with the Joker, and then illustrated it with and then Tex Avery illustrates it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's perfect. So anyway, these these stories here that we're getting into really puts the mask on the map. So I think these yeah. are the ones that kind of grab the attention of the reader. Our cutie does a great job of getting this story across. We will jump into this first series, which is just titled The Mask. It's first four issues. Came out in 1991, August of 91 to October of 91. As I said, written by John Arcudi, art by Doug Mankey, and Matt Webb gets in there on the colors as well with Doug. Lettered by Pat Brousseau and David Jackson. All right, let's talk about our, our I mean, our main characters here in this first, this first series. We start out with Stanley. Stanley Ipkiss. If you've watched the movie, you know who Stanley is, sort of. However, as far as characterization goes, he's definitely different in this book. I would he say is that he's less sympathetic. Yeah, exactly. He's more of a jerk. And he's still he's still a nerdy, kind of scrawny guy, but I mean, he doesn't he is actually involved with a lady by the name of Catherine or Kathy. And he finds a mask and brings it home to her as a gift. Now, of course, on the way home, he runs into a, a foul of some bikers. Some bikers beat him up pretty good, but he goes home and he as he gives her this gift. There's there's some discussion about how moody for some reason that Stanley's been lately. And then I think it's later that night he goes to the bathroom and he sees that this mask is laying on the toilet and he thinks that Kathy's put it there. So he grabs it and he's like, I'm going to get her back, puts the mask on his face. And whoa, whoops, that was a mistake because the mask all of a sudden takes over and he becomes the mask, the character that we know, the big green face, which I, yes. I, I, they never I, call him the mask in any nope. of these series. It's like big head, big head, big head, big head. <laughs> yes, he is definitely known as big head throughout here, but he's got the big green head and he all of a sudden he realizes that he's feeling good. He's, he's feeling like he has these powers. He, he jumps out to the outside. He slides down a drainage pipe <laughs> and he realizes that it, things feel he's like, well, that worked just like it does, does in the cartoons. Um, <laughs> seeks revenge on the bikers. He goes and finds the bikers who attacked him and he makes them pay. So yeah. a revenge fantasy, that was the word I, or the phrase I thought you were going to use earlier, because that is very much what Stanley is, is enjoying right now. He's got this, he's got this mask that gives him these superpowers. And now he's going to partly make that it's, pay. it's partly that it's partly detective noir. It's, it's, right. a, it's definitely a mashup of different genres. I'll agree. So Stanley begins to make a list of people that he wants to make pay. He's got a, a shit list. My shit list. And at some point, Kathy confronts Stanley about his behavior. She noticed that things have gotten a little bit more out of control here lately. He's definitely acting a lot more erratically. And there's a bit of an altercation to where she kicks him out. Now he goes, I think at some point in here, I think it's before he gets kicked out. Maybe it's before mm -hmm. he gets kicked out. He, he ends up finding somebody, some dishonest mechanics, and he kills them really violently. <laughs> he mm -hmm. shoves a muffler down. It's Yorkie's mufflers. He shoves a muffler down one guy's throat. He impales another guy. This was crib from, from the book to the movie. The muffler oh, bit. Really? The yeah. muffler bit? I don't remember that. Maybe not, maybe as violently. You don't see the muffler in the guy's mouth. Well, the guy is not dead, right? Yeah. I assume he's not but, dead. <laughs> but and again, I, I I was only barely paying attention to this part, but the the bit where he takes revenge on the car mechanics is in the movie. Okay, all right. Well, that makes sense. He even goes so far as to find like, an old teacher that he had and kills her in front of the students. Yeah. Yep. I'm like, geez, he criminy. So I was he's... really uncomfortable with that. Oh like, man. It gets bad. Yeah, like, cause it, cause it, it, I don't think he does, but I think it's either there or another place in the book where it's definitely intimated he kills a kid. Oh, he hits a kid for sure over the yeah. head. One of the bullies. I think it's shortly after that. Mm -hmm. He's on his way back and he runs into this kid that's getting bullied and he grabs right. the bully and hits him over the head. But I think the kid is still he's laying out unconscious, but he's got one of those cartoon big lumps that are about the size of three feet. <laughs> yeah, on, that, there, there's something else along the, the stuff in the classroom is really unsettling because right. I don't know what the authors thought they were doing here. But he is he kills a teacher in front of a bunch of kids and then it's laughed off like it's nothing. And I know they, dude. Did, they did take a panel to kind of address the fact the kids are like, what the fuck? But <laughs> 
<laughs> it's, it's it is over the top. Yes, you're you right. Know me. I, over I, the top. I don't make a big deal about stuff. I tend to I tend to not get sensitive about certain things, but that has not aged well. Mm-mm. No, <laughs> no, it hasn't. Killing a teacher in front of young students not okay in two in 2024 i'm sorry nah, hate to be the nah. sissy on the podcast but there's yeah. no way an editor lets that go now yeah you're right this is bef- this is 91 just before image hits oh yeah just before image comics dude um, i was a huge fan of dark horse comics back in the day i read all the aliens and predator stuff there were some other dark horse things that i dabbled into but dark horse was in in the 90s when i'm in high school and reading actively mm-hmm. reading comics Oh, you were, there were no cooler kids than the kids who read Dark Horse comics. Marvel and DC, that was that, that's for children and sissies. Dark Horse is where it's at, yo. <laughs> that's right. Just looking at what had Arcudi had done prior to this. I mean, he he was involved in the mayhem stuff that kind of brought the mask out, but uh, prior to this, really he doesn't have much of a resume. And the reason I was looking is just because he's letting loose here. I feel he's got like, okay, Dark Horse isn't really going to give me a whole lot of flack if I kill this teacher in front of these kids or if I have severe over the top bloodletting against policemen (laughs) because that's Mm -hmm. about to happen. But yeah, you're right. There are moments throughout the book where you're just like, oh my gosh, man, I can't believe that this is on the page. Very much a like, okay, I'm going to do what I can do here and just kind of get see what I can get away with. Mm -hmm. But anyway, all right. So uh, we have our first introduction to Lieutenant Calloway, who is investigating these murders. And he ends up encountering the mask at home. Stanley, I think, goes to sleep or something like that. And Kathy takes the mask and tells him that she threw it away. Yeah. Um, He freaks out and there's a bit of a confrontation. He kind of is like, oh, you know what? You're probably right. I'm just going to sit down. I'm going to watch some TV. And as he's watching the TV is when he starts saying uh, he starts realizing that there's a couple people left on his list. And he says this out loud. (laughs) Kathy hears it. And she's like, you know what? You're a sick pig. Get the hell out of my house. And now he's kicked out. All right. So later that night, Stanley breaks into Catherine's apartment, finds the mask. But Catherine hears him, calls the police and they show up. And I think at some point the mask gets shot a few times. Mm -hmm. but nothing happens of course it's the mask but so just kind of let everybody know when somebody is wearing the mask you are invulnerable granted you may get shot i think there's a couple panels where some of these people have holes in their chest that they just stick their hand through and they're fine there's it's just like a cartoon it's just like a cartoon you put this on and you are a cartoon character with Uh, blood and guts though oh yes with (laughs) yeah if if it's wily coyote if wily coyote bled everywhere (laughs) <laughs> right so all right so in Catherine's apartment the police and the mask are dueling it out the mm-hmm. mask is not caring about killing policemen he's doing that in front of everybody he grabs a gun he shoots one of them he makes his way down the steps a bunch of other policemen are coming up he unlo- pulls out a bazooka which by the way he's materializing weapons like, out a, of nowhere yeah that's a running gag throughout the mask like how did i get this gun <laughs> <laughs> so he pulls out a bazooka and blows this stairwell to hell. He escapes. Catherine realizes can we, now. Can we talk about that for just a second? How not great the whole gun thing is handled? Because it took me a couple of times of him doing that for me to realize, oh, he's just materializing the guns. Right. Well, he did. Yeah, he doesn't even know what's going on. Just well, like you said, he's like they don't even address it. The oh, author no. doesn't actually address the fact that he, he's just running. And then the because I remember this distinctly while reading it. He's he's doing something. He's like running down the stairs or whatever. And then in the next panel, he turned around, he's got a bazooka. And I remember thinking to myself, where did the bazooka come from? They don't acknowledge it in the comic. They don't acknowledge nope. that he materialized his weapon out of nowhere. It, he just does it, and, he, and it's it's totally no sold. And that happens a few more times. And then it's later on, it might even have been in the second series, where Calloway's just like, where did this gun come from? <laughs> like, <laughs> like it was an editor's note. You have to we got to have an explanation. Yes, we yeah, have, you have to, to address this at some point. You have to at least acknowledge. So Catherine starts to realize that the mask has this influence on Stanley, mm-hmm. which, by the way, I, I definitely did not go into every confrontation the mask had with police because there mm-hmm. were a lot of that. Ha- there was a lot of that happening. Plus, it was always over the top, something crazy, and he, he mm-hmm. was killing many policemen. Right. At one point, I think he jumps onto that. He's uh, uh, they have a roadblock or something like that. And he jumps mm-hmm. on top of a car and just kills, I don't know, 30 <laughs> policemen with a flamethrower and a machine gun. 
Right. So anyway, he's like, I've got to leave town. So he heads back to <laughs> Catherine's apartment to grab his clothes. And then it's at that time he puts the mask, takes the mask off, puts it on the bed, and Catherine shows up. She puts the mask on and then unloads a gun into Stanley. And <laughs> Can we talk about him. how every time Catherine puts the mask on, it's always a splash page? <laughs> <laughs> Every single one. <laughs> uh, I don't know at what uh, issue we're into. I think it's probably issue two or issue three. Stanley Epicus is dead. Yeah. Which is, yeah. Okay, your hero from the movie is not the hero in this. Book. I was gonna say if you were if you read the mask comic thinking this was the life and times of Stanley Ipkiss as the mask, you would be incorrect. It would be not severely let happened. down. Yeah. So Stanley's dead, and it's at this point where Catherine's like, "Okay, I've got to give this mask to somebody. Get it out of here." It's she understands that this thing is is clearly causing yes. the chaos that's happening around here. So she takes it to Lieutenant Kellaway and says, "Okay, look, this has been a problem. Don't." Whatever you do, don't fall asleep. No way saying. Whatever you do, don't get them so wet don't after, midnight. after midnight. After midnight. <laughs> yes. God damn it. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't wear the mask. Right. And uh, he's like, okay, sure. No problem. Yeah. Well, hands up, of course. All right. the mask. I, can I tell you how dumb this was? I understand <laughs> comic book writers, whether except for maybe what's his fuck, Ed, whatever. These are not people who Brubaker. are familiar. I was thinking uh, Brubaker. Um, Brubaker. Yeah, Brubaker, Brubaker, Orville uh, Redenbacher. <laughs> I understand these people are, are are not law enforcement experts. But let me tell you how, if you walk in with a mask that may or may not have been responsible for killing a lot of cops, they're not treating it like, eh, just throw it at a desk. It's, it's not a <laughs> file. Hi, I have evidence. <laughs> I have evidence. The, I have the murder weapon, essentially. Right. To, like a hundred law enforcement homicides <laughs> on top of <laughs> another one. This, this town by the way i don't know where they're coming up with cops but they've <laughs> run out of qu- uh, at least a few yeah right anyway. they're fucking they look like sea monkeys that they grew <laughs> so she comes in and she's like i have this mask and he's just like fumbling with it at his desk he's like all right you you, you dumb broad hey, get you get out of here you skirt and she fucks <laughs> off and he's like doesn't put it in evidence control <laughs> like, nope. doesn't doesn't take and it, what i don't understand is that it's not a secret what this is there is no reason for her to be like to walk in there and have plainly said hi my name is broad vagina and i'm the girlfriend of stanley ipkiss who murdered a whole bunch of people namely cops he did so with this mask if you put this on you will become a homicidal cartoon character i know it sounds crazy but I, did you happen to catch the fact the guy who was doing it had a big green head connect the dots <laughs> they'd at least right. take a statement <laughs> okay right, right. They, they would take the mask the mask would go into evidence control and she would they would have taken a statement on her they may or may not have had her committed who knows but that would have been the end of the hat the way it's handled i don't want to deconstruct the comic too much and get too caught up in the minutia but it really bothered me because it was like well we <laughs> We never had designed to keep Ipkiss as the main star. We want Detective Kellaway to be the star. Right. It's it's a right. re- first of all, it's a really jarring change to go from Ipkiss to Kellaway, and the only thing connecting them is the girl, the girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that kind of bugged me. I like the story in general, but the transition from Ipkiss to Kellaway was a little awkward. And then again, yeah, and I- her whole the way the whole way she does it is. Like, he doesn't believe her. Then he's fucking with it. And he puts it on. He was like, oh, wait a minute. He takes it home. Like, yeah. The moment, he doesn't even just sit at the police office. Does he put, or he doesn't put it can on. I, his, can I tell you, you're not supposed to take evidence home? Just, 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 just to be clear about this. You're, in case anyone's, like, I'm not a law enforcement expert. I, I work with law enforcement. I don't work as law enforcement. And I'm not a legal expert. I just play one on TV. But you're not supposed to take evidence in a murder case, home, in a multiple homicide case home. Right. Right. Like, yeah. You just imagine we have the gun. We, we have the gun that killed a hundred cops. Well, I'm going to go home and play with it. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Spanky was shooting in the backyard <laughs> with the homicide gun. <laughs> That's how that works. Oh, yeah. man. And Ipkiss, by the way, just to kind of talk about him. He's dead now. But at first, y- you're kind of like, oh, right. Ipkiss is going to put the mask on and he's going to go take care of some of these people that have wronged him. But you can see there's definitely something wrong with him you that is plain to see that he that's mentally that's another weird structural thing with the book i can kind of see why the movie does what it does because 
it's like a few panels and he's the mask. We do not get to know this guy at all. And it's because we're going to get rid of him in an issue. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, he's um, be dead. Tell him why you get to know a little bit more. But if he's, not, he's no Jim Gordon. We're not no. like following him <laughs> home, dealing with his house, his wife and his trials and tribulations. We kind of get to know Kellaway a little bit more, but we don't get to know Stanley Ipkiss at all. It's literally a page or two and he's the mask. Right. Right. And then he's 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 putting the mask on and he's he becomes a villain. He is yeah. not a hero. He is definitely a villain of of this. And I mean, clearly the mask is very powerful. And, and what you kind of learn as we go through the rest of these books is that the mask has this kind of as powerful as it is. It also brings forth something similar to kind of like what you see in the movie where Stanley's mm-hmm. kind of a reserved kind of dude. And then he puts the mask on and all of a sudden he's not. He is out there. He's smoking. Yeah. Um, he's almost committing a sexual assault. Right. <laughs> right. So, I'm um, sorry. I again watching with 2024 20, eyes and being a little sensitive to this sort of thing. Now I'm watching Jim Carrey for, kind of force himself as the mask on Cameron Diaz on a park bench. And I'm like, <laughs> thinking he's being thinking speaking of things that have not aged well. Yeah. All right. So Callaway's got the mask. He puts the, of course, he ends up putting the mask on. It becomes the mask and starts using it for vigilante justice, which I thought mm. we was going to get with Stanley, but no, Callaway's Callaway's definitely a little more suited to actually be the person to maybe deal out this vigilante justice. He foils a robbery and kills a drug kingpin by the name of Rapaz. There's there's definitely a lot more story about some of these villains that end up <laughs> dead really quickly. You don't need. <laughs> Rapaz has this whole thing about how he's killing people with making them overdose on drugs. And then mm-hmm. lo and behold, the mask. I mean, I guess it's just enough to kind of make you understand. Well, why. sure. At some point, one of the things that we complain about with other comic books is you're just killing becomes killing Ultron bots. Mm-hmm. You, if you don't, you, you need a reason to root for your protagonist. You need a reason for your antagonist to be beaten. It's it's the pro wrestling logic. You, you want to hate the heel and love the face, and you want to see the face beat the heel. Mm-hmm. If you do, if the heel's not giving you reasons to hate him and the face isn't giving you reasons to love him, then you're just watching a gymnastics routine, and that is only going to get you so far. Yeah. Well, Rapaz is also the kind of way we get introduced to one of the main villains of all three issues, and that is Walter, mm-hmm. the large <laughs> mob enforcer that of he's all a, I the think he's, characters that make it through all three of these books. <laughs> yeah, he's, just, he's like the mute Hulk. You know what he reminds me of? He reminds me of human, not dark side. The, the thing that killed Anna's, Doomsday. Doomsday. He, remind, he reminds me of humans, human Doomsday in that, well, we've written ourselves into a corner. We have nobody who's too strong enough to kill Superman. So we have to create a being to kill Superman. So we'll create this monster that ends up doing it. And it was like, okay, well, we have the mask. He he's indestructible. There's nothing you can do to him, which really sucks the tension right out of the book. It's like, yeah, we, we can we can kill him. We can blow him up. We can throw him off buildings. He just gets up and keeps coming. Let's create Doomsday <laughs> to fuck with him, and he kind of does. Yeah, I didn't think Walter was actually going to last past this first encounter. He ends yeah. up fighting the mask. The mask gets the better of him by electrocuting him a- after. <laughs> I think riddling him with a few bullets and then electrocuting yeah. him. And I was like, Oh, he's dead. Okay. Well, uh, that's not the case. Walter. <laughs> not dead. I want to go for a walk. <laughs> so, okay. Kills Rapaz. And there's a whole big to do now about Kellaway's job and running in with the captain, but his behavior is becoming a lot more erratic as well mm-hmm. with the mask off. Kellaway is definitely acting a little more erratic. Kellaway ends up saving some hostages at a place called Sincini's, where there's, again, more drug families, or I should say more crime families that are going at each other's throats. There's a hostage situation. Kelly ends up walking in there. But of course, as he gets in there, he dons the mask. He take out he takes out everybody, saves all the hostages, and he's a hero. But watching that is Catherine. And Catherine sees all this go down and she knows that he's got the mask. So she shows up at Kellaway's and says, I want the mask back. And at that point, they're like, Okay, look, Kellaway's look, I understand. All right, I will lock this in a wooden desk. There's no way I could get to it. Here's the key. That's uh, I knew what was going to happen then at that <laughs> point. So Kellaway locks the mask away, but retrieves it later to take down a corrupt of- official. I think he's the assistant DA named Lister. And Kellaway, during a where the cop the cops start to chase the mask, they corner him. And Kellaway is the best way to describe it is that he he's 
taking out taking out policemen but again he's a policeman himself he doesn't want to kill everybody but he mm-hmm. is at the odds with the policeman the captain ends up following him along with lionel his partner i didn't talk about lionel yet but lionel is his partner and the captain ends up running away from the mass the mass turns around and he sees lionel and he starts to lionel's like put him up man let's go it's fisticuff time they go at it they're pounding each other as well let's just say the mask easily wins the fight he begins to beat the crap out of his own partner Kelly ben- beats the beats the crap out of his own partner and grabs a stick of dynamite throws it into lionel's mouth and lights it and then realizes oh crap this is my friend this is my partner i'm about to kill right so he fights the mask back or i should say fights the the, the mask from overtaking him and grabs the dynamite, turns around and explodes. And all that's left, all that's left in the road is a puddle of debris. And we're thinking that the mask is dead. However, no, that is not the case. Catherine ends up on Kellaway's steps at his house, pounding on the door while Kellaway, sure enough, is alive in his basement, but has dug a hole and covered yeah, John Wick style. <laughs> yeah, he pounded a crap out of that concrete, dug a hole put the mask in he's he's covered it with fresh cement so that's where we end it and where look, Callaway is sitting, like like he's going into catatonia right he is clearly afraid of what happened and yeah. i mean i think a lot of it is the fact that he just about killed his partner one of his one of his yeah, only friends it's I that guess sam and frodo thing. moment where they go tumbling down the stairs and frodo pulls sting on on samwise and, and he's crazed and he's about to kill him and then and samwise like hi it's me <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's your sam <laughs> i don't know what i don't know what's happening here but stop trying to kill me stop trying um, to kill me yeah yeah i liked I, you know, the thing about dark horse comics is because they they were they weren't serving quite the same masters as marvel and dc they were not afraid of a tragic ending they were not afraid to kind of leave you like oh this doesn't have a happy ending at all he's just fucked up at the end of that book. And who knows if they were going to do any more mask books at that point. This could not have sold well. The Dark Horse Publishing could have <laughs> could have gone under because what publishing company hasn't by this point. So they just end it with he buried it. He buried it in a cement tomb underneath in the basement of his house like John Wick. Mm. Never to be seen again. And he's and he's just like drooling all over himself. And his eyes are like, Ugh, you know, overall, aside from some nitpicks that we've already talked about, I, I think... Once we got to the Callaway stuff, and Callaway is sort of the, you know, the mask is a battling of one soul in a lot of ways. At least this first book, um, it is very much like, what if the darkness within us came out? Yeah. If you think about like, every negative thought you've ever had, every revenge fantasy you've ever—that's why they're called fantasies. If if every if the worst parts of you were made alive, and then in, and then on top of that, indestructible, what what would you do? Something I talk about with my kids is very recently, as a matter of fact, I said the, the job of the parent is to install a moral compass in their children. So this is one of the jobs. You were there to coach. You were there to teach. You don't just have the kids. And it's, like, it's not enough that you give them food and clothing and a roof over the head. You have to talk to your kids. You have to coach them. You have to teach them. You, right. know, you have to install, instill that moral compass. And that's what stops us from doing the bad things. That yeah. stops us from acting out on our worst impulses. That insanity. <laughs> now, what happens, and, and I'm making light of it, but what happens when your moral compass goes away and your insanity goes away? And now you're just this menacing f- f- pile of anger and hate. Violence. And violence, yeah. And you can't be stopped. It, it, it reminds me of one of the Marvel cartoons, one of the, mo- one of the movies they did. Loki and the Enchantress separate the Hulk from Banner, and Banner goes to hell, but he's ex- but I think he's experiencing heaven with Betty, and the Hulk has no... The Hulk doesn't have that countering influence anymore, so he's just rage, mm. and Loki sets him up, sets him on Asgard, and he That's starts destroying... Right. And he starts destroying Asgard, and they're like, okay, stop, and he can't, because he's just rage. He has no... No counterbalancing influences. He has nothing. He has nothing in his brain to stop him. He's just. He's just. He's going. And then because he's in, he's also indestructible. Also, they, there's nothing they can do. And they, they have to convince Banner to leave his fantasy with Benny to go back into the Hulk. And he's like, "Fuck off, no." Yeah. And so that was kind of my takeaway from with the mask was not so much if kiss because. And I almost think when they were writing this, they were like, "Oh, how are we going to redeem this guy?" Well, we can't. So let's kill him. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now we have to put the mask on somebody who's redeemable. Yeah. 
<laughs> the fitting the fitting end for Ipkiss was the way I mean after the way he was portrayed I mean at one point he's he's got his hand he doesn't even have the mask on I don't think and he has right. his hand raised to Catherine like he's going to smack the shit out of her yeah and so yeah he's a he's a real shitty guy so yeah the only thing they could do is actually well the way we need to do this is this guy needs killed and yeah. the girl that or the person that needs to do it is Catherine so but yeah, there's uh, there's also stuff about this revenge fantasy. But you also get to you get to do this without being actually without people knowing it was you that did it. That's where mm-hmm. the mask comes in. You get to right. wear you this don't look mask like yourself. You don't yeah. look yourself. You don't. You know the the fa- your facial features don't match. <sighs> Right. And and the mask is something that everybody wears. A lot of times you hear people wear masks every all, all day and their their inside is not or I mean, what, their inner self. Their inner it's, self is not shown. Yeah, this is backwards. It's a term that gets you gets used with narcissism where why is the narcissist exhausted? Because it takes effort to keep the mask up in public right. around certain people. And then they, they have to drop it because it, it takes effort to be that way. But when you see the narcissist being charming, delightful, bubbly, sunshine and bubbles, it's the, it's the mask. The real the real narcissist is this really dark, shitty human being. Mm. So in that sense, it's the mask is also the comic book is also like a euphemism for you put on this thing it's the reverse of what i just said but it works the same way you put this mask on and you're this entirely other being you're this fantasy being yeah and in this case this fantasy being is a cartoon murderer (laughs) well i mean this was this was definitely different than the movie i had no (laughs) idea (laughs) yes jesse yes yes, it was (laughs) i had no idea what i was getting into i I knew about the violence but i was just like okay well i'll be rooting for stanley ipkiss throughout this thing the Mm -hmm. whole time no i was not and did you read dark horse comics in the 90s i can't say that i did i i I know uh, of the dark horse comics that were out there it was probably alien and predator that i knew of but yeah as far as reading i wasn't even reading that probably read some of that later on down the road but Mm -hmm. i was not reading dark horse comics at the time i was worried 92 is when image hits now image image comics you yes yes we've all seen unspoken issues (laughs) there's some bloodletting about all you guys talk about is image comics (laughs) I love it. I, a matter of fact, we did seven founders, seven days, probably a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. But no, the they pushed the envelope too there. So, yeah. but I, as far as Dark Horse went, I they had a lot of licensed properties too that they did. Aliens, they had yeah, I Predator, say they, they had the, Star Wars. I was gonna say they, yeah, we've talked about the Star Wars Dark Horse. I love that shit. Yeah, right. I think they did RoboCop. I think that might have been the like RoboCop Terminator comic. Terminator. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure Terminator was involved. Yep. So, I mean, they could, and it's good that it's good that Dark Horse put this out there for sure because it was it was one of those ones that pushed the envelope. With all as steeped as you are in comic books and people who read comic books, you're more you stayed longer and currently involved more in the comic book culture than I ever have been or ever you know what will be. No one hit you to the mask. No one was like, Jesse, if you like the Punisher, if you like that street level shit, you should check out the mask. You'll love it. If anything, it was probably Wizard Magazine. They might have done. A, I'm sure they had to have done a special on the mask movie when it was coming out in 94. Mm-hmm. They probably talked about this comic a lot. But yeah, man, I mean, really, that was where I was getting my comic book information from. It was the Wizard. And okay was wizard magazine the friends that i had that i could talk comics with in night in early 90s and maybe the mid 90s were probably i don't know one or two people okay. like, your local your local comic book store did did you talk to those guys they talked to you was that a place where like-minded comic book readers could just sit in commits so okay we had one shop and mm-hmm. the way that it was it kind of went down i think we didn't have any other shops in marietta i can tell you that much the fucking um, that were town you grew up in <laughs> it really was dude it, it it was amazing that marietta had a comic book shop back okay. in 92 93 but w- the way that that started was the guy was a, a he was a card dealer he was okay. a guy that dealt base, baseball cards right. football cards stuff like that and then comics were kind of a secondary thing for him so sure. he could make a little bit of money off that magic so can we talk about how the comic book stores became a, a thing unto themselves because comic books were always a side thing that you bought elsewhere either on newsstands that's like stands, convenience stores store, right. yeah cigar and cigarette shops or as you're saying like hobby stores 
they used to be called hobby stores where you buy baseball cards and stuff like that. And yeah. <clears throat> there was like a small section of comics. It's years after all of that, that people start saying, well, we're just going to focus on comic because there was this window of time, this magical window where comics were big business. Oh, yeah. They read a lot of comic books. There was a lot of comic books to, to, to be that were being published and enough could be sold on an on an ongoing basis that people just made those now comic book shows comic books just have to have become not to completely derail the conversation but no, fine. Have, you been, have you been in a comic book lately comic books might my it says comics on the marquee but they might as well say this is funko pops and fucking pewter figure store right well it, i mean look so jordan took over my goodness i think he started in 2005 mm-hmm. i want to say that so Good friend uh, from over at Kapow, the pop culture podcast. He runs Asylum Comics here in Marietta. And yeah, he he's a representation of sort of what you're talking about there. He's got plenty of comics, but he cannot just focus on comics. And he's talked about this a few times on his podcast about how you have to you have to vary your business. Now, there are other shops around the area that do something, do stuff way different than Jordan does. Jordan does it's primarily comics, but there's figures on the wall of comic book characters comic related stuff he's got young a whole young adult section dog man is something mm-hmm. that's come up on his podcast a few times i don't know who the hell dog man is my kid does though i these these are small young adult or kids yeah. books that that could be bought you go over into parkersburg and i went over there one time mindy was getting a tattoo there's a comic book store right beside the lost legion i walk in there and it's a massive store that probably had, I don't know, 15 to 20% of its room dedicated to comics. The rest of mm-hmm. it was all cards, yeah. a big spot for people to play their yeah. card games. And also, I'm sure they probably held D&D kind of like what Ronnie yeah. does. Ronnie's involved in that multiverse stuff, and he is primarily yeah. going there on the DM all, stuff. So. There's a comic book store near where my kids go to school, and there's plenty of comics in there. But there's also manga and oh, no. there's a whole bunch of role-playing stuff funko pops as far as the eye can see you know games you now can't just sell comics because you'll go out of business and a lot right. of stores have yeah this series was not sitting on kroger's newsstand <laughs> i'd walk into the grocery store people's news didn't carry this stuff they carried they usually carried the marvel and dc stuff whatever could sell on the newsstand so you know, I didn't have access to this. I didn't have anybody that could tell me about it other than Wizard Magazine. And Wizard Magazine mm-hmm. was something I started picking up in 91, 92. So, but yeah, I mean, as far this would have been in my wheelhouse, though. This would have definitely because 92, when I'm picking up, when I start picking up image comics, the thing that draws me to them is the violence. Right. This this has it in spades. Mask oh, yeah. has violence in spades. What makes the character so interesting is the fact that he's a cartoon character brought to life. But you've got to also think that what they were trying to get across is what if this cartoon character was real? Yeah. And what would it be like for everybody else? <laughs> oh, these people are going to die when the mask whips out a hammer and hits somebody square in the mush. Well, they're going to be dead. And that's what happened. It's one of the things about this. And I don't know if this is if you can kind of link this as just sort of greater comic book writing. But there's not a whole lot of what the mask actually is. And I don't mean the character. I mean, that's in my notes, too, man. I put in here. You don't know about the origin. You have no idea. Right. You have no idea what composition makes up this mask. Is it magical? Is it religious is this is this possessed because because that's the thing the mask is a character unto itself the actual physical mask talks to you 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 speak through the mask but when when you start to divide yourself from the mask the mask is like where are you going like no 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 this is what we're doing and we'll try to overtake your personality and so i said is it possessed by is it like chucky is it possessed by a demon what is this yeah Yeah, you have no idea and so by the end of the book you really you have no idea really like it's it's kellaway's story and it is definitely Callaway kind of wrestling with his soul. I wish there had been a little bit more time in any of these books, the, the three that we're going to talk about, that actually talks about what this thing is. And I guess there's an argument to be like, oh, but sometimes the evil is better if you don't know. That's the John Ronnie and I got into that argument when we were talking about Michael Myers. It's if you don't the shape. Uh, yeah, if, if Michael Myers is unrelenting, is this unrelenting violence, unrelenting murder with no explanation for why he exists the way that he does. It's much more terrifying. It's 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 Kyle Reese's line from the Terminator. Speaking of which, you can't reason with it. You can't stop it. All you can, all you can do is run. Okay, I mean that that. But then it's like 
how do I then sympathize with the difference between if you sympathize with Sarah Connor, you want her to live. <laughs> you don't want this thing to murder her. You want right. her to beat the Terminator. It's hard. It, it, it becomes a little wonky to try to get yourself to root for Kellerman, Kellerman, because he is the mask. And so if you're like, oh, well, fight this thing, Kellerman, we, we, we have, in that sense, we're rooting for him to get rid of this thing. But we still don't really know what it is he's fighting with. You just know it's, yeah. a, it's a mask that turns him into cartoon Tom and Jerry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have any clue and you don't yeah. get any answers. This is only a four issue series. It's yeah. no wonder that they wanted something to happen. And that's going to happen in our next episode. We're going to be talking about the mask returns. So, yeah, man. I mean, I don't have any other notes here. Did you have anything else you want to say? Go, man. The plugs? All oh, right. really? Just only plug everything that we talk about is on W2M Net- W2Mnetwork.com. Our YouTube is W2M Network. Our Twitch is W2M Network. But if you're looking for clips of any one of our shows, if you want to hear my son recite My Bitch Better Have My Money from I'm Gonna Get You Sucka, if you want to hear karaoke, concert footage that I've got, it's all on my TikTok. I at Mark Rattledge, A M A R K R A D U L I C H. At Mark Rattledge on TikTok, you'll see all of that. Okay. All right. Yeah. Hey, you're listening to the W2M Network right now, most likely, because this is the Source Material Comics feed. And uh, yeah, you can go back in the archive and check out a lot of the other stories that Mark Rattledge and myself have talked about. We just recently finished up our GCPD. No. Gordon of Gotham. That's what it Gordon was. Gordon of Gotham. Gordon of Gotham trade that you had where we talked three stories, which was Gordon's Law, GCPD, mm-hmm. And what was the fi- what was the other one? Gordon of Gotham. Gordon of Gotham. Yeah, that's right. The the title thing. So anyway, yeah, you could check that out. That is that is the last three episodes that Mark Radlich and myself did. And Mark, he he plugged unspoken issues already. Where we talk nineties comics, we're doing it right now. He only talked the image. <laughs> I don't think so. We are definitely Marvel heavy over there. Check that out. It's me. It's Dean. It's Derry. It's Matthew Price comes on there. Evan Bevins comes on there. You, you can hear Strip Snap every once in a while. Yeah, Mark Radlish knows all about Strip Snap. The uh, it is now. I'm going to call. I'm, I get the name mixed up. Marvel. <laughs> Marvel <laughs> Snap. Like you damn did it. that. I'm just like, oh great, he's playing into the gimmick. It's like, God, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> snap material folks you can hear me and Mar- me and evan bevins talk about that mobile game marvel snap all right we're out of here that's mark radlich i'm jesse starcher have a good one bye bye thanks for joining us all of this would not be possible without w2mnet.com so make sure to seek them out for more podcasts if you enjoyed what you heard today please feel free to share and we look forward to entertaining you again soon